Well, this is the introduction to Meg Bowman in her own words. Meg Bowman grew up on the prairies of North Dakota. While still in her teens, she hitchhiked from Phoenix, Arizona to Philadelphia to attend the Henry Wallace Progressive Party Convention. There she met Pete Seeger, H.L. Mencken, and Paul Robeson. In Phoenix, she and a group of radical progressives decided to desegregate the city, and they did, well, almost. I guess you have to find out from her why it's almost. Meg taught sociology at San Jose State, planned and escorted over a, a dozen international study tours, wrote or edited 12 books, and had numerous articles and poems published. She never missed a civil rights or peace march in the Bay Area. As a director of fair housing, an ardent feminist who raised three sons, was awarded the Humanist Heroine Award at the AHA 2010 conference, and for 10 years was co-chair with Rosemary Matson and then Annie Laurie Gaylor of the Feminist Caucus of the American Humanist Association. For once each month throughout 1994 and 1995, Meg brought to our humanist community a reader's three theater presentation. Most of the dramatic readings were on historical women, such as Deborah Sampson, who fought disguised as a man in the American Revolutionary War, others Emma Goldman, Margaret Fuller, Margaret Sanger, and many more. Meg has written two new books, two new works. On Sunday, August 25th, Meg will narrate a work on courageous Viola Luzo and how her murder relates to the June 25th disastrous U.S. Supreme Court decision to destroy the hard-won Voting Rights Act of 1965. And just as an aside, that... Oh, well, okay, we'll move, move on there. Today, Meg brings us courageous Dorothea Dix and the topic of mental health, certainly a current social issue, especially as it relates to gun controls. Once a teacher, always a teacher. So Meg, who was Dorothea Dix? Can you hear me now? Hey. Yeah, today we're going to take a brief look at the life of a courageous woman who initiated humanitarian social change on behalf of the mentally ill. A woman who was a crusader, who made a difference. Yes, one of those cutting edge, pioneering, assertive, pushy, humanitarian, humanistic, unitarian women. Well, she was born in 1882. 1802. When I say 1802, nobody knows what I'm talking about, these youngins. They don't know what ought means. 1802. She grew up on an isolated farm in Maine. She said she never had a childhood because her mother, get this, 18 years older than her alcoholic father, was so ill that Dorothea was mainly responsible for raising her two younger brothers. Some resources say that at the age of 12, she ran away. But at any rate, she went to live with her wealthy grandparents in Boston, Massachusetts. Because her grandmother was very strict, Dorothea moved in with her more liberal aunt, where she excelled at school and became a Unitarian and a personal friend of Reverend William Ellery Channing. He's a big deal with the UUs. Although mostly self-taught, Dorothea was precocious and started teaching at age 14 at a school in Worcester, where she taught for three years. Education for girls was limited, so at age 19, she opened a girls' school 
in Boston and published a textbook and a book of poetry expressing her beliefs. Now, Dorothea broke off an engagement and she never married. All of her life she suffered from incipient tuberculosis and malaria. And the TB forced her to rest, but she continued writing books. She wrote a lot of books. In 1831, she opened another school, and after six years of teaching, she was exhausted. So under doctor's orders, she went to England to live with a wealthy Unitarian family for a year. Well, back in Boston, her grandparents had died, so she had an inheritance, relieved her from the need of working, and she did not regain her health until 1841. And that is the year she was asked to teach a class to 20 women in the East Cambridge Jail. Well, among the drunkards and the prostitutes, there were many women there whose only crime was insanity. Now, ancient beliefs, well, I know a lot of people still have these beliefs, but the ancient beliefs that evil spirits, the devil, the devil, inhabited the body persisted. Historically, almost any kind of deviant behavior was thought to be caused by evil forces. Think exorcism. Think of the women's holocaust in Europe when between the 15th and 18th centuries, hundreds of thousands of women were labeled witches and hanged, drowned, or burned alive. Think of the Salem witch hysteria. In the 19th century, Ms. Dix found mentally ill women bound by chains, in iron cages, beaten with clubs, thrown in jail or prison where they were kept naked with no heat and on the brink of starvation. Remember jailers insisted, crazy people can't feel the cold. Dorothea Dix won a court case and living conditions at the East Cambridge Jail were cleaned up and the women were provided heat. So after seeing the damp, cold, filthy quarters of the jails in Massachusetts, and so many women incarcerated only because of mental illness, or deviance, or because a husband said his wife was crazy, any of you been married would probably be, well, <laughs> Ms. Dix started checking out other jails and almshouses in other states. And she went throughout the nation. There were 30 states at that time, but she went out throughout the nation. And she found the same dire conditions. So now it's 1841. There are only six hospitals in the nation that recognize the mentally ill as human beings. She has bouts of malaria, lung hemorrhaging, but this woman kept records and made reports to state legislatures. She wrote letters, she drafted legislation, she lined up political support, but she never, ever appeared in public. Women simply did not appear in public discourse. Politics was strictly by and for men and usually affluent white men. In 1844, Ms. Dix proposed she got 200 additional rooms for the Massachusetts State Lunatic Hospital, this is in Worcester, and despite bitter opposition, got funds for a new mental hospital, which was located in Trenton, New Jersey. And she called this hospital my firstborn child. You'll hear about more about that later. Dorothea Dix is credited with the establishment of 110 facilities for the mentally ill, plus specialized schools for nurses. Now we come to 1848, and this is where our story will stop. In 1848, Ms. Dix established a school for the blind in Illinois. 
She wrote several books. She received a grant from the United States Congress for five million acres to be distributed for mental health facilities across the 30 states. Remember it was in July 19th and 20th, 1848, that the first women's conference was held in Seneca Falls, New York. This is when Elizabeth Cady Stanton had the audacity to the end that women have the right to vote. Everyone <gasps> gasped. And the only way that proposal passed, barely, was because Frederick Douglass made such an eloquent plea. You have to have the vote. Well, when Elizabeth's father, Judge Stanton, heard what his daughter had proposed, he knew she'd lost her mind. And he jumped into his buggy and dashed to Seneca Falls. The very idea of women voting, let alone active in politics, was ludicrous. It was crazy. It was insane. What's the matter with those women? Today, insane is a legal term, and we'll talk about that later. So just remember that when women cannot vote, cannot own property, cannot hold political office, they must persuade men to support their causes. It's the only way Dorothea Dix could get legislation passed was to work through men. So our story today is just one story. It takes place in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is just one story, it's a true story. And watch as Miss Dorothea Dix gets a bill passed in North Carolina for a hospital for the mentally ill. Now I want all of you to use your imagination. This is a hotel room. It's at Mansion House in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we don't have a way to turn the lights off and on to indicate it's nightfall. <laughs> There's a, n a new act. It's in, we're going to see four acts. But so use your imagination. And the people who are going to be performing today have had no rehearsal. <laughs> so it's a cold read. So be nice. So, so here's a slice of life back in the day, the late winter of 1842. It's daytime, and we are in a hotel room in the mansion house of Raleigh, North Carolina. It's 1848. 1848. And the maids get in here and clean up this room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's got the first lights. <laughs> All right, Claire and Martha. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, Clara. All right. Them politicians we got here in this hotel ain't half as strange as that woman that's got that room. She looks like any other white lady to me, only she's prettier than most. She dresses stylish too. What does a high yeller like you know about stylish dressing? I'm almost pure white. My mama was a high yeller and my daddy was all white. And I be free, too. You ain't been set free more than five years. And you're talking like you was some kind of lady yourself. That white man that owned your ma and begot you ain't nothing but trash. So don't be putting on airs with me, missy. 
and if folks hadn't shamed him into setting you free, you'd still be a slave. Of course, I admit you're prettier than most women your age, but Martha, let me tell you, you ain't as pretty as I was 30 years ago. <laughs> All I was saying was she looks like a lady to me. Well, she ain't, and that's the truth. How come you say a thing like that, Miss Clara? Because she's one of them Unitarians, that's how. <laughs> you don't know what a Unitarian is. You just say it that because you heard those politicians say it. You always act like them when the General Assembly is in session. That's, that's Crazy, you mean. Lunatics. Bonkers. I'll bet she's tied up with those crazy women in New York. One in the right to vote. And that Stanton woman's husband, Henry, he's one of those radical abolitionists. Crazy folks. Am I get the right page? Hmm. It's all time out. Is this the right page? It's not the same. Hmm. This one? Uh, yeah. That's right. Sorry. We'll hear that again later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Somewhere. <laughs> okay. Right. Ladies don't do. Uh, yeah. Well, she ain't no Christian, that's for sure. And that's the truth, too. No Christian woman would do the things she does. Like what, Miss Clara? Like writing books and things that's printed in the newspapers all over the country. Like getting involved in politics and taking stands on public affairs. Ladies don't do those things. I heard a man say, this ain't the age of Amazons. This is modern times. This is 1848. Well, that last part is true. <laughs> She's one of them ups outsiders from up north, a Yankee. What's always coming down here to meddle in our business. Know what she's been doing for the past two or three months? She's been gallivanting all over the state, checking on lunatics. Why, that lady must be Dorothea Dix. I've read about her, Miss Clara. She's rich and famous. Her granddaddy in Boston died and left her a fortune. And she's spending it all on lunatics. If she wants her money to waste her money on crazy people, that's her business. But she's got no right to ask us taxpayers to be as crazy as she is. I know you heard a politician say that. Well, it's the truth. Better show me the page. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't the way I got it, Miss Clara. I read in the newspaper Ms. Dix is making a study of our jails and our poor houses. You know, where they keep people who are mentally ill? Crazy, you mean. Lunatics. Bonkers. I'll bet she's tied up with those crazy women in New York wanting the right to vote. And that Stanton woman's husband, Henry, he's one of those radical abolitionists. Crazy folks. Well, we're not going to abolish slavery. And women got no business voting. And if Ms. Dix thinks the taxpayers of this state are going to pamper lunatics, she's as crazy as the lunatics she's so crazy about. Why, Ms. Clara, you certainly heard a lot about Ms. Dix. And I suppose you don't see nothing strange about what, uh, those that got this room? I read in the newspaper, his name is James C. Dobbin. He's a state representative from Fayetteville, here for the General Assembly session. Mr. Dobbins here with his wife. What's so strange about that? You don't see nothing strange in his giving up his seat in Congress and then running to be a little old state representative? Oh, you heard some politician talking about that. The newspaper said he'll be at General Assembly only a few months every two years, and that'll give him more time for his law practice. Fiddlesticks. There's more to this than meets the eye. Yeah? What? I don't know. The politicians didn't say, uh-oh, somebody's coming. Is that it? No, no. Oh, 
I beg your pardon. I thought you'd be finished by now. <laughs> Are you sure? Miss Thank you. <laughs> no, no. Oh, God, please. No, no, no. Take me. Let me go. Please take me away. What are you doing in our room? I'm Dorothy Dix. I may have to read her script. It's uh -huh. <laughs> our room. Our room. You have a fever. Oh. Uh, yes. My husband, James C. Dobbin, of Fayetteville, and I are staying here. Open your mouth and stick out your tongue. Open um, your mouth and stick out your tongue, dear. Well, wait a minute. You're on Dorothy. Uh, where, where is he? Where is your husband? He, someone should be here with you. Oh, well, he's at the General Assembly, where he's supposed to be. He secured the service of, of a nurse, and I dismissed her. I'm not that ill. My dear child, I am a nurse, and you are that ill, and you know it. Why did you dismiss the nurse? Well, my husband has already given up a seat in Congress due to my health. He denies it, but I know it's true. Yeah, see, we have a different script. <clears throat> Don't worry about it. We covered that. I'm Dorothea Dix, dear. Okay. <laughs> You're ill and oh. You're not hearing what I'm saying to you. Oh, I, I no. do have a physician. I saw him today, and he gave me some medicine. Well, you're seriously ill, and you must be in great pain. Now tell me, why did you di dismiss the nurse? Just because of your husband? Yes. He's already given up a seat in Congress due to my health. He denies it, but I know it's true. I see. And you were afraid the nurse would discover just how truly ill you are. And he, she would tell your husband. If he knew, he'd give up his political career altogether. Well, you must love him very much. I do. He's truly a wonderful man. He's strong and kind and gentle, all that a man should be. He was meant to do great things. I must not be a weight around his neck. Well, I'll keep your secret on one condition. I'll do anything. You must let me be your nurse. Oh, I couldn't do that. You see, I couldn't pay you. I would have to get the money from James, and then he'd know. My dear, my grandparents left me more money than I need. I will be paid by the joy and happiness that come from helping those in need. Now you stay where you are, nice and warm, while I go to my room for some papers. I'll work on them right here. What are you writing? <clears throat> I've written a document for the General Assembly, and I'm checking it for errors. Gentlemen, I'm in here, in Mrs. Dobson's room. Uh, 
I'll be with you in just a moment. Don't bother, Miss Dix. We're a delegation from the Whig Party, and we support your bill. But the Democrats are in control, and nothing can be done in North Carolina. Ma'am, but it's, I'm sorry, it's impossible. There is no such word in my vocabulary. Enlightenment is what's needed. This bill is truly necessary. This bill. And this will throw light on the subject. The Democrats don't want light, Miss Dix. Gotta give them the mic. The mic. Oh. The Democrats don't want light, Miss Dix. Why, we made a motion to light the lamps in the portico at the Capitol, and the Democrats voted it down. The Democrats in this state love darkness, Miss Dix. I will present my information, gentlemen, and they will imp improve it. That's me, excuse me. <laughs> John W. Ellis is the leader, and he'll shelve it. He's committed to railroads, not hospitals. I'm sorry, Miss Dix. You'll never get it past him. It's impossible to get the bill passed in this session. I will get past Mr. John W. Ellis, and I will win. Good night, gentlemen, and thank you for coming. Who were those gentlemen? Oh my dear, you should be a you should be asleep. That was a delegation from the Whig Party. I asked them to call regarding some legislation I want passed. Is that what you're writing? A bill? No, this is in support of the bill. That and I, I want the bill passed by the General Assembly. This is called a memorial. May I read it? Oh, my dear, there won't be time. I'm expecting a delegation from the Democratic Party at any moment. Copies of this memorial must be made and given to the legislators right away. Otherwise, I won't be able to get the bill through this session. Will you read me part of it? until the delegation arrives. Oh, all right, and then I'll give you a copy later. <clears throat> Thank this you. is what I wrote. Gentlemen, I respectfully ask your attention to the subject herein presented and discussed, and solicit your prompt and favorable action upon the same. I come not to seek personal claims, nor to seek individual benefits, I appear as the advocate of those who cannot. She's got uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> he already, he already it. Um, go back. <laughs> I appear as the advocate of those who cannot plead their own cause. I come as a friend of those who are deserted, oppressed, and desolate. I am the voice of the mentally ill whose piercing cries come from the dreary dungeons and closets, cellars, stalls, pens, and waste rooms of your jails. I am the hope of the mentally ill who are confined in the cells and cages of your prisons and poorhouses. I am the revelation of hundreds of wailing, suffering creatures who are chained, beaten with rods, lashed to obedience, and cut off from all healing influences, from all mind-restoring cares. Could the sighs and moans and shrieks of the mentally ill throughout <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm over here. I'm John Ellis from Rowan County. 
<laughs> Are you Miss Dorothea Dix? Yes. Yes. Well, you asked for a delegation from the Democratic come visit you. Yes. Yes. Well. And what would be your business? I desire you, Mr. Ellis, to present this document. Yeah. <clears throat> and you will pre present this to your assembly. You gentlemen, I expect, will sustain the motion. And I expect you to print enough copies so that each member of the assembly has a copy. And I need several copies for my personal use. You we do. do. Oh. You yes. do. Yes. yes. Uh, I'll introduce it, Miss Dix, but it'll die in committee. You know that the Whigs are supporting this only for political gains. Mr. Ellis, is that why you Democrats are against it? You too can make political gain, as you put it, by merely supporting it? Well, Miss Dix, I, I will introduce it, but that is as far as I'll go. Gentlemen, thank you for calling. Okay, it's now a few days later, and look, Louisa is sitting up in, her, in the bed, and Dorothea comes, Dorothea, scene three, you're entering briskly, and you say, Louisa, how are you feeling today? <laughs> Louisa, how are you feeling uh, today? you got to put the mic up to your mouth. Louisa, how are you feeling today? Dorothea, when you're around, I always feel good. Well, I've been around for several days now, and you're still very ill, my dear. Thank you for not telling James. He went to the assembly this morning in very good spirits. My dear Louisa, he's sure to know sooner or later. Please let it be later, Dorothea. He's so happy right now. James gave me a copy of your memorial. It's beautiful. He said he'd see to it that you get the copies you requested. Thank you. Thank you. But as yet, it hasn't gotten the hospital bill passed. Yes, it's been defeated again. Oh, I'm so sorry, Dorothea. Truly, I am. The doctor was here again today. What did he say? That it won't be long before I die. Please don't feel bad. I don't mind. Not really. Louisa, sometimes I think you want to die. Perhaps I do. The pain is excruciating. And if I can't get well, I'll only ruin his life. There's no need for James to suffer, too. You knew I couldn't live long, didn't you? I only knew that you might not get well. You're very brave, Louisa. But you're very foolish, too. I was perfectly willing to nurse you those days that James stayed here to do it himself. He isn't a trained nurse. You would have been wise to tell him the truth. I know I should have. Soon. Yes. Soon. May I ask him to pay for your personal services? No, Louisa. My happiness is in nursing you is reward enough. I'm more concerned with the treatment of the mentally ill here in North Carolina and throughout the nation. My heart goes out to these poor creatures and I'd like to help too. But most of all, I wish I could do something for you. You can do something, Louisa. You can ask your husband to support the hospital bill. As leader of the Democratic Party, if James Dobbin supports the bill, he might be able to, to save it. Please ask him, Louisa. That is, if you believe he should. 
If he knew you as I do, he couldn't doubt the bill. If it's my last request, he'll honor it with all his heart and mind and soul. I'll die happy, Dorothea, knowing that I'll be giving some happiness back for all the happiness life's given me. The light fades to dark. Out you go. <laughs> it is now several weeks later, and we will look in as Clara and Martha are on stage with their cleaning supplies for our last act. Job. And Clara says, I don't like to clean up this room after what happened in it. It's been weeks since Miss It's been weeks since Miss Dobbin died in here. The dead can't hurt you, Miss Clara. She ain't dead, Martha. That was her spirit in James Dobbin when he spoke to the General Assembly about that hospital bill. Just as sure as you're born, when she made her last request and asked him to support that bill, she passed her spirit on to him. And that's the truth. Then she's got a mighty powerful spirit, Ms. Clara. They say there wasn't a dry eye among the politicians when Mr. Dobbin quit talking. There weren't. There weren't. It was some sort of miracle at work. Them politicians voted to build a hospital for them luna, lunatics, the mental ill folks. Like money growed on trees. And that's the truth. I wonder where Ms. Dix went. Ma, she went to Fayetteville to Ms. Dobbin's funeral. I mean, after she came back and the General Assembly adjourned, when she checked out of that room. To another state to build hospitals for those Luna, for those, those poor people that are mentally ill. <laughs> Maybe this country does need more mental hospitals. After all, this ain't the dark ages. Why, now it's 1849. The newspapers say Miss Dix is a good Christian, Miss Clara. Of course, she ain't a member of the true faith like I am, Martha. But I guess she's a good lady just the same, even if she is one of them Unitarians. Mm. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring him back. <laughs> well, shortly after Miss Dix got her hospital bill passed in North Carolina, Dorothea Dix got a bill passed in Washington for a mental hospital for Army and Navy men. But when President Pierce vetoed it, she went to Europe for a rest. At age 60, she volunteered for the Civil War and was appointed by President Lincoln to be superintendent of nurses. Dorothea was the first woman appointed to an administrative position in the federal government. It was hard work, and her weight went down to 95 pounds. She was at odds with the Army doctors who didn't want female nurses in their hospitals. But Miss Dix won. See War Department Order Number 351 of October 1863. After the war, she continued her reform activities into her 80s. When she retired, she lived at that first hospital she created, the one she called her firstborn child in Trenton, New Jersey, where she died in 1887 at the age of 85. Miss Dix was adamant that her work go on. She would be appalled to know that since 1950, Deinstitutionalization de has closed most mental illness facilities. 
Since 2009, states have cut over $4 billion in public funds. Yes, jails and prisons are de facto once again psychiatric facilities. Today it is estimated that at least a third of those imprisoned are mentally ill. You will also find the mentally ill among the urban homeless and in headlines reporting murders in families and massacres at schools, theaters, and shopping centers. If someone in your family needed help, do you know whom to contact? Do you know what facilities, what programs would help? There is, don't go away folks. There is for the mentally ill in your community, in your state. If Miss Dix were here, she would know. So let's bring her back, Miss Dorothea Dix, and Louisa Dobbins, and Martha, and Clara, and let's bring back the Whigs and the Democrats. Come back and take a bow. Come on, you Whigs and you Democrats. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. For a cold read, you did darn good. Yeah, you, get, you all get an A for the day. I didn't get to change in my other blouse. Ah! <laughs> so, well, anyway, you did just fine. Thank you so much. I'd really like to make an announcement after this is over about our own urban homeless. There's a event. Why don't you do that right now? Okay. Uh, can you find a mic? Here's a mic. Here's a mic. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi. In the spirit of this um, production, I'd like to uh, uh, announce that there's a group that's forming in Palo Alto called Stop the Ban. As you might know, the city is, is intending to pass a ban on letting homeless people sleep in their vehicles and refusing to provide any parking or facilities for them. And many, many people are coming together to write petitions, have meetings, and so on to stop this. And this will be voted on on August 5th at the city council meeting. And so um, there will also be a community dinner with the homeless a week uh, uh, next Saturday, the 27th, uh, at Coverly School. I think it's at 6 p.m. I don't have the announcement with you, but it is. Okay, so somebody has passed that out. Are there flyers for that? Oh, good. And so this is, uh, the city council has been invited. The people from Green Meadow have been invited. And anyone who's interested in supporting some really nice people that I met that are homeless and live in their vehicles, I guess it's more correct to say unhoused because they do have homes. Their vehicles are their homes. So if any of you have the uh, will to support that, you would be very welcome at either of these events, Saturday's dinner with the unhoused or Monday night's city council meeting on August 5th to vote on this issue. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Clara. And I wanted to add a uh, last thank you to a very key person uh, to us, of course, Meg Bowman, who <laughs> writes absolutely fun historical plays. And it's always fun to uh, do this without a rehearsal. Thank you. I, and, I <laughs> and I want to honor Selma, who is the casting director. And uh, all of your costumes were just yes. great. Senna. Senna has a closet that's as big as a house that's full of uh, costumes. And she's as great decorating people as she is uh, decorating your tables. And you may notice the centerpieces, those are all Senna's and they're different every single week. So thank you, Senna. Yeah. Thank you. And speaking of the table centerpieces, they're all Egyptian because in 1799, the Rosetta Stone was discovered. In part, it was built into a building. Somebody used it as a building stone, and someone recognized what it was. So that was the first time that they had any clue as to what all those hieroglyphics meant, because it was in three languages, and they could do that. Yeah, I'll, say, I'll, I'll make a few remarks. And I, I just asked Meg if she would entertain some questions from you as well, but she's, I guess you're going to make the remarks yeah, first. I'll make a few remarks. Okay, the mic is yours. Okay. Oh, you don't need it. I don't need one. 
<laughs> okay, but it can go out to the audience. Here's a couple of them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. If you ever run into someone who thinks that Ronald Reagan is the cat's meow, remind them that when he was governor of California, uh, he eviscerated the mental health services here in this state. And then when he was president back in the 1980s, he gutted President Carter's Mental Health Systems Act, shifting the burden to states and local governments. And so that by 1985, the federal government provided only 11% of mental health agency uh, benefits. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen some of the pro television programs, Frontline, The New Asylums, and what's happening with the mentally ill in the prisons and the jails. Um, the Los Angeles County Jail is one of the largest jail psych facilities in, in the nation. And the Veterans Administration, they turn away veterans determined to be dangerous people. They have no beds available. And one last thing, in 2013, that's this year, 92% of the patients in California state psychiatric hospitals got there via the criminal justice system. So I think that Dorothea Dix must be turning over in her grave as to the dismantling of the mental health system. So I'll give you one last quote. It comes from a great article for those of you who take Mother Jones. Um, let's see, what issue is this? Uh, May, June of this year. Schizophrenic killer, my cousin. You get Mother Jones. It's an excellent article. And I want to do just one quote uh, from a psychiatrist in that article. And the psychiatrist says, quote, we ignore the mentally ill until they commit a crime. In eight states, one must be a danger to self or others to receive mental health care, which means, and I'm quoting, you either have to be trying to kill yourself in front of your psychiatrist or trying to kill your psychiatrist. <laughs> so, and uh, oh, oh, one, oh, one more thing before we open it up. Uh, you may have read that the 2013 DSM, this is that, the Bible, the guide, the dictionary that is used in mental health, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders came out, DSM-5 it's called, in 2013 to recognize patient symptoms, to diagnose a mental disorder. And they all have numbers, don't they, Denver? And why do they have numbers? So that they can collect insurance, because it's all set up uh, on that. Well, there's been a lot of criticism. Now, this just came out, but there has been a lot of criticism uh, because uh, they don't include genetic and anatomical hallmarks. And so the National Institute of Mental Health has launched their own book. So, but it took 13 years just to produce, to produce uh, DSM-5. Uh, and they took homosexuality out as a uh, mental disease. Can you imagine that? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, do you have any questions about Dorothea Dix or what's going on in, in California or locally? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> no. 25% of the U.S. population can be called mentally ill in any given year. Little depression, little anxiety, a little attention deficit disorder. Good. Hi, Meg. Uh, did Is Ms. That Cheryl? Cheryl, yes. Hi. Cheryl. How are hi. you? Hi. 
So did Ms. Dix actually win any prizes or honorary doctorates or anything for all her work? Did she receive any recognition? Not really. No. That's a no. pity. <laughs> Not even among the Unitarians. So, yeah. Did Cheryl and I went to the, uh, and Denver went to the uh, United Nations uh, women's conference that was held in Kenya in 1985. We had 175 people in our group. And it was a blast. Yes, question. So there are a lot of different causes that people could pick up. I wonder if there was more behind why she picked this one. As, I, as to why? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, if yeah. I caught enough of like something. Yeah, her alcoholic father, who was a Methodist preacher, by the way, itinerant Methodist preacher, and uh, her mother that was ill all the time. Uh, but I think it was when she went to teach that class to those 20 women and uh, saw there's so many there that uh, were not being taken care of and were cold and, and so <sighs> treated so poorly. Uh, I think that's what Autumn, it motivated her to to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, Meg. I'm over here. Uh, yeah. I I was wondering. I don't know if you um, know about this, but you may. I was just wondering in the investigation of mental illness if uh, anybody's determined with any kind of certainty, like how much of mental illness is caused by genetic factors versus environmental factors. Does anybody know? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it's being studied. So, one thing I thought was interesting, uh, Denver put me on to two books. These are 1950 books, uh, Madness, the Invention of an Idea, and uh, Madness and Civilization. And one thing which I thought was interesting, going back to the Renaissance, in England, and Scotland, they would round up crazy folks and put them on a ship and send them to other countries. Sometimes it was called a ship of fools. You heard that phrase, ship of fools? Uh, they would, uh, pay, uh, people would pay uh, as uh, this was as an entertainment. And sometimes they just dump them in the other country. So then a month or so ago, I pick up the San Jose Merc, <laughs> and I read an article that the state of Nevada had rounded up over 1,500 of their mentally ill folks and given them one-way tickets to Northern California and a couple to some other states, and just dropped them off no references of where to go, no money, just dropped them off. Hello? Isn't that terrible? Yeah, we ought to do something about those people over there in Nevada. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes. Um, where, where? Yeah, I, yeah, I am I'm here. Uh-oh. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Let's I might comment on the very last thing. Uh, for several centuries, Poland was used to be Europe's favorite dump for oddballs. But uh, but but anyway, I, I, w I was struck by the dresses that were worn, especially by the women that would be going out in public. They're very dark dresses. They're very long, so forth. They look like 19th century hijabs. But however, uh, what's missing in a lot of our a lot of the dress that was prevalent at that time were hats and veils. They were what? Hats and net veils. The net oh. veil were the net veil were continued all the way until about the 1940s. So, yes. And then it almost looks like a westernized version of a hijab. Yeah, yeah, hats with veils. So yes, uh, as I speak or as we sit here today. In France, there are riots going on uh, because uh, a Muslim woman uh, 
in her traditional outfit, a policeman asked her to raise her veil and provide identification and the husband attacked the policeman and the entire community rose up and there are riots going on uh, now because of, uh, of that. Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, yeah, over here. Yeah. Um, I think I might have the title wrong, but uh, it's a movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, yes. with, I think, Jack Nicholson. I'm trying to remember the author of the leading uh, female actress, but I can come to mind. But I was just wondering, does that movie kind of represent a little bit of what uh, Insane Asylums used to be way back? Oh, yeah, there were a number of movies, The Snake Pit and... Uh uh, that uh, scare the bejesus out of you. Uh, but uh, yes, it has a long history and we have a long way to go uh, for sure. We're, we're not even, you know, how do, we, I bet every single person in this room at one time was crazy. One time was nuts, you know, a broken heart or death in the family or whatever and you were just out of it or, or whatever so then we have then how do we do that just the trials and tribulations of life and those who are just a little bit and those who are seriously mentally ill say one in five families has someone with a mental illness those are the statistics yes I have I'll bring the mic to Ann in a minute I'm over here Hi. Um, my question is I may be remembering wrong, but I, it seems to me that back when they started getting rid of the mental hospitals in California, one of the reasons given was that there were so many involuntary commit, committals to the mental hospitals. Could you comment on that? Yeah, and then they, yeah, I, I, I remember when the patient rights movement was, uh, was really uh, big here because uh, so they said well you can only hold for observation so many hours and and so on yeah um, well I was wondering what you recommend that we do uh, you know if we were it's the state of California where it's doing the right thing what you think of as the right thing what would we be doing to help our mentally ill and what percentage of the mentally ill can be helped with current medication, or is that even the way to go? Yeah, the pharmaceutical companies, the pharmaceutical companies, in my opinion, have the whole country by the Grotzmeyers. So they've got, uh, I belong to Kaiser, and uh, go, I don't care what you go out there for, they're gonna prescribe a pill. Pop a pill for this, pop a pill for that, pop a pill for the other, and uh, they have, uh, as you, as you know, they have all kinds of rules and regulations about not uh, allowing generic and cheaper medication to, uh, to be available. And uh, so we're, we are in the stage of, of a pill. No matter what you have, mental or physical, you're going to get a pill. So. <laughs> Yeah. So, I don't know. She said, "What can what can we do?" Yeah. So, but uh, I don't know. It's not my field. I'm a I'm a sociologist, and I thought this was an interesting story for social change and how she had to go behind the scenes. She had to keep records. She had to get the right men. She had to manipulate to get uh, the changes she wanted. But I don't know, are there any psych majors here that have some ideas as to what could be promoted? Another question, yeah. Abandoned uh, uh, humanity. Yeah, now, very quick one. Uh, I'm with Geyser. 
<laughs> and I'd like to say something in honor of Henry Kaiser. Oh, I like uh, Kaiser. Oh, okay. No, what I wanted to say was that uh, this about a month ago, I was listening to the news on KCBS, and they have ads, you know, and this one was from Kaiser. And it was saying that uh, for when you're depressed, it's a good idea to go listen to music and comedy to that, that helps you. And I said to myself, well, that's very decent of Kaiser because the psychiatrists are gonna be making less money from people that are depressed. So that's very nice of them, I think. Yeah, very good. Yeah, when I go out there and the first thing they do is take my blood pressure, I said, you should never take a person's blood pressure when they've just been on the freeway for crying out loud. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I understood well your question. You want to know what can be done and what is done in California regarding mentally ill patients? Is that what what we were asking? Yeah. Well, no. Well, one thing uh, they keep saying: you spend two or three thousand dollars in treatment will save you a good fifty thousand dollars in jail or prison. Uh, costs. So we need we need all kinds of things. Now yeah. Denver has studied the, the uh, system in China. I'll tell you one story. Some of you probably remember Florence Tom, uh, Tom, uh, Thompson who was uh, very active in the humanists. In 1987 we were in China and she kept asking people, well what do you do when people uh, act out? It's in China. Uh, what, and, then, and so finally she, got, she says, well, what do you do if someone, you know, really acts weird and so on and so on. And this man says, well, we tell them to go home and behave themselves. I said, well, that's one way to handle it, I guess, just go home and behave yourself. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, lunch is ready, actually, so I'm oh. a zero sign, so thank you very much. Okay. And to all, all the right. actors, too. <laughs> So, go and eat and behave yourselves. <laughs>